IT Pro TV, binge worthy learning for IT teams. Why is it binge worthy? It's learning presented in an engaging and entertaining talk show format that beats voice over PowerPoint snooze fests. Watch over 3,300 hours of content in their on demand library on your desktop, on the go, or in the comfort of your own living room. IT Pro TV is IT training you and your team actually want to watch, which means a better return on your learning investment. Get started with IT Pro TV for teams by visiting itpro.tv forward slash security weekly and start a seven-day free trial and get 30% off standard or premium IT Pro TV memberships using the code SECWEEKLY30. Today's determined attackers easily bypass even the most advanced network defenses. Trying to ramp up staff to detect their back doors can cost thousands of dollars and take months, even years. With Active Countermeasures AI Hunter, we enable junior analysts to detect even the most advanced back doors in a matter of hours. Sign up for a demo and purchase our product today by visiting activecountermeasures.com forward slash PSW. Active Countermeasures, make every analyst a hunter. Endgame automates the hunt for both known and never-before-seen adversaries in enterprise networks. Built on unique knowledge on the adversary's tools, techniques, and tactics, Endgame's centrally managed agent prevents, detects, and responds to advanced adversaries in the earliest stages of the kill chain without prior knowledge. Endgame, automate the hunt. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. This is the security news for this week. And we want to start off. We always start off with my stories. I mean, I have one to start off with. I was going to say, man, I want to start off with one of yours. <laughs> oh, let's do it. <coughs> Javelin webcast is coming up. Hold on. I got a quick announcement. Oh. Was that in my I announcements? Thought that was a, I thought that was a story. My keyboard but... doesn't work. What's the announcement? Johnny Blaze with the announcement. No, I'm just Can they hear you or is that just in my head? It's in my head. I'm talking. So now it looks like I'm talking to myself. Thanks, Johnny. Uh, <laughs> So, Javelin Networks will be doing uh, a webcast uh, coming up. And let's see. Uh, on Overcoming the Limitations of Privilege Account Management is being held on May 24th from noon to 1 p.m. You're going to want to turn tune into this and be turned on by it, I guess, is what I was trying to say. <laughs> Myself and Joff Thire will be presenting about Active Directory limitations and some of the common things that are missing from an Active Directory environment in terms of security, which is in there by by default or not in there by default mm. security's not in there by by default is really what we're saying javelin networks will talk about privilege management and some of the shortcomings that you might run into in privilege management and trying to protect your active directory environment it's going to be awesome it's going to be awesome you're going to want to tune into this webcast so larry you've got stories Oh yeah, I've got stories. You got uh, stories, and, and man. You know I, I want to hear one of your stories. You had um, like that one time you kicked your BlackBerry <coughs> across the room at DefCon. Yeah, drop kicked actually. Drop kicked. Um, right, I think the big one that uh, I had that I think it I wasn't, wasn't the only one. Blackberries were like gigantic. So, you could have taken someone out with that. Could have hurt him big mm. time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my story. Jeff also had. See how I do that. Uh, Jeff also had the same story <laughs> about uh, PGP uh, because this was a gigantic story. And not at the same time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, as, as I put it, uh, it was funny. I was conversing with a customer. I sent them a, a PGP signed email, and they immediately responded back, "Oh my God, you're using PGP? That's not secure. It's not secure anymore. That's it." And I'm like, "Yeah, well, I, no. Did you read? Did you actually read the article? Because it's a lot of fun." Well, I woke up that morning to a tweet from Miko Haponen saying, Ooh, PGP broken bad. This, this looks really bad. So I went off and read the article and I'm like, okay, yeah. it's not that bad. It's yeah. really, I P mean, PGP, it is PGP. PGP is perfectly fine. The mathematics behind it is still all work. But it, yeah, it's not so much PGP as it is the mail clients yep. implementation. Yeah, yep. exactly. It's about the implementation well, of said product. And, and the, the reason I wanted to talk about this was for that very reason. Most cryptography is not technically broken. Right. You find weaknesses in the implementations, mm -hmm. or you wait for them to decrypt it and you steal it, or you steal or you purchase the keys. I Jason, mean, going back to the DOD days and espionage back when I was working, you know, in the eighties, famous espionage cases, but it was just, you know, spies stealing keys and and selling them to the bad guys. Jason, we talked about this in Hack Naked News. Uh, for our listeners, do you want to just like distill it down? Uh, some of the details we talked about quickly. Yeah, I mean, um, there were a couple of things here that, that went on with this. Um, the first is that the person 
who's running receiving the email basically they've messed up the configuration of their their PGP client or add-on in their mail client. Mm-hmm. You know, they they have it set to decrypt automatically. When the message arrives, you got the keys plugged into your add-on and it decrypts on the fly. Oh. And <clears throat> you know, if I'm going to go to the extra lengths of PGP encrypting things, I don't think um, it's that big a deal for me to type in a password when I happen to get one of these messages. Now, Jason, there's different options because you can set it so that you just enter your password once. And it caches it for a period of time? For a period period of time, time. right? So you can adjust that time, and that's just like the level of annoyance you're willing to deal with, really. Yeah. Yeah, and then the follow-up piece was it they had it configured, their mail client, to pull down remote content automatically. Yep. And, and, And then the... Your mail client then tries... Basically, what happens is they... uh, um, they have some boundaries marked in the message, and it's, you know before you get to the PGP block, it has a URL that opens up, and they don't close it off all the way. They close it afterwards with the double quote angle bracket, right? Mm-hmm. And when you when you decrypt it, your mail client tries to fetch this image link, and includes all of that text as part of the URL, and that's when the attacker gets a hold of it. They also said though that the attacker had to have access to your network. The ability to intercept and modify traffic as it went by on the fly. So, I mean, you, <laughs> there was a lot of things here going on with this that yep. you were already screwed on your network until you had your mail client the, set up the, wrong. The, the other one, if I remember correctly, uh, hearing what that it also required that you had uh, HTML enabled email. Yes. Correct. Yes. Correct. Uh, like, n- no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that dynamic. No. Fetching of content. Yeah. Right? Well, and also what? my mail oh. client doesn't load images by default. Yep. Unless Same. Yep. unless I trust certain uh, senders for yep. that. Yep. Definitely yep. not Larry. <laughs> no, Definitely. No, no, Larry. It required it required a lot of levels of failure the way yes. I read it. And when I first saw it, it was like the headline of PGP big problem. And then, uh, like you said, yeah, I went not, back and looked at it, and I really. went, eh, not really. It's it's like a if if you failed this far. Yeah, you if might as well go all the way. If you're dumb and use PGP, then yes. Yeah, <laughs> but what does the attack look like? Do I have to be exchanging encrypted messages with someone, or just able to I- inject content into their email? Yes, this isn't like uh, a I phishing think, thing. I think right? that was the thing, Jason. Was you have to be able to inject content into those emails that are encrypted, so that you can then decrypt them. Yeah. Right. You had, like, to ha- you had to have plain, t- it's like a plain text attack. You had to have, you had to be able to push things in there that were going to be encrypted so you could crack the encryption on the back end. Yep. Right. So I had to send yeah. Larry. So, I mean, it, it was a massive failure kind of problem. I, I mean, it's almost like a physical access yeah. failure. So you, you had to have all this access. You had to be able to push fake email. It was on and on and on. So it I had to send was, Larry an email. Larry would have to respond and encrypt it and then my content. In, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And, not, and not only that, someone would have to be in the middle of that to be able to interject Right. Content to download right. that because if we're communicating, content. likely we're encrypting each other's emails. Yeah. Right, we're, we we had, had to be able to, keys so to, be able to get it. to yeah. those packets and mod them. So it, it's, right. it's so a they massive could, so they attack. Could, so they could insert the download for a third party client, right. which would then do the 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 attack as Jason described to send it to a third party. And, I got you. Know, you. Well, yeah. So that really is even less of a deal it's than I esoteric. originally thought. Yeah. <laughs> now that we talk about it more yeah. in depth, and Jason, you had a comment in there somewhere. I don't know. I lost it. <laughs> uh, You're hanging out with me too much, Jason. Uh, I lost my train of thought earlier before the show. But salad shooter. Salad shooter. So what was I going to say? Oh, mail clients are updating <laughs> so that you can get past this flaw, which really sounds like it's not that huge. Yep. It was one of those of stories deal. you wake up to. It's like, oh, my God, this guy is fault. Nope. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> Carry on. Yeah. Carry on. Yep. Did you guys read this uh, article about uh, don't roll the dice when prioritizing vulnerabilities? I did not. This reeks to me like a a sponsored post from Kenna in this other company that I can't pronounce. Um, What's interesting, there's a couple of interesting things, uh, and I think Jeff will probably have something to chime in as we both worked for a vulnerability management company for quite some time. Um, So it's talking about basically if an organization... Uh, miraculously fixes 98% of the flaws in their environment. Those 2% could be wrong. One of the things that it is a proponent of is fixing the vulnerabilities that have an associated exploit with them in addition to potentially relying on CVSS scoring Mm -hmm. to do that, which both of those things, I pretty much, 
Uh, well, exploits are one thing, but CVSS score is certainly, yeah. certainly not. I mean, it's a guide. Right. But C- C- what C- happens C- is CVSS is a is a group that d- defines the rating for those vulnerabilities, but doesn't have any context around your business. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, yes and no, because I think you guys are talking, and I might speak technically inaccurately here, but CVSS version is a two that's currently out there, but. When Paul and I were at Tenable, three. they were they were rolling out uh, a version three yeah. that did have a lot more context built into it. It's just because there's so much context built into it, it's really hard to implement in a in a scan engine that's mm-hmm. designed to be automated and run efficiently and things like that. So yes and no on the CVSS scoring. The yeah. version three, I think, does do uh, what what you're looking for. But but, but, but so uh, I, I, so Ron Kula told me, and he was Ron and I were actually just chatting on Enterprise Security Week. Weekly. Um, and, and this reminds me of something Ron said kind of early on when I was looking at the vulnerabilities, taking into account CVSS scoring, looking at how we did that at Tenable and, and what it meant for our customers. And he said, you know, Paul, like one of the, the things that's kind of weird is that like, what if you had the scenario where as an organization, you said, I'm going to fix everything that's a CVSS score of 7.0 and greater. Well, what if an organization said, organization said, well, you know, this has a 7.0, like, maybe that could be a 6.9. Like, can you make that a 6.9 so that we don't have to fix, like, yeah. there's stuff like that that could come about. And it, it kind of begs the question, if you're basing your remediation on this external scoring system, even though, as Jeff says, I agree, version 3 was much better and taking into account other factors than, like, just the vulnerability itself, if you've got this system that's based on this like basically an arbitrary number at the end of the day Mm -hmm. because where does this vulnerability exist is it in a system that doesn't have access to sensitive data and is on the outside of my network and there's these other compensating controls Mm -hmm. such as firewalls and network monitoring and uh and NAC maybe and and so what is my score for that vulnerability? Like, how does that adjust my own internal well, I, I, score? I think that's a place where you have to start on that, which is where you need your own scoring system for that. Yes. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this giving you a baseline and saying right. this is a huge threat, but right. then you need to you need to cash that into your model of vulnerability management because you can't just say at seven we fix it. Right. You have to bring it into your context mm-hmm. and say we this is a system that's in Dr. Zhang's lab and nobody can get to it unless they break in on wires hanging from the ceiling. Yep. Okay, that I don't care if it's a nine. It's no not really a huge threat at yep. that point. And I'm not we saying don't strict fix it. it. You should is, fix it eventually. Is Matt, is Matt still in the studio? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. It's right here. Somebody somebody plug his ears a minute. Okay, you didn't hear this. Don't listen. <laughs> Matt no, was no, never no, here. No, Matt, that really means but, you want to listen to this. All right, all right, all right. One, of, one of the hugely frustrating things about our industry is this overemphasis, in my opinion, on, on the vulnerability. And what you're describing, Doug, is what's needed, unfortunately, is what most organizations don't want to do. They want something simple. They want something automated. They want that arbitrary number that tells them they have to do something or not and yes they want to game the system so that they can drop it by a tenth of a point so they don't have to do anything um so a a little bit of a tease if anybody's going to circle city con i'm giving a talk there and one of the things i want to talk about as part of a conversation is uh maybe maybe we're paying too much attention to the vulnerabilities maybe we need to be looking at other things and and not 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 do away with vulnerabilities but in the, in the in the in the idea of a risk equation where vulnerabilities are a variable and this whole industry has been built on trying to drive down vulnerabilities to drive down your risk maybe we should consider that vulnerability a constant and look at some other elements of the risk equation i i agree with that now where it can actually be useful in my opinion is uh, Rapid7 actually introduced uh, in their sponsor, but uh, they introduced this feature, which I thought was really cool. And that is, you can say, if there uh, is a vulnerability that is downloaded into my vulnerability scanner (coughs) that is of a CVSS score, you can define this rule, of Mm a 9.0 or greater, you know what? Automatically scan my environment and then tell me, alert me of any instances of this vulnerability. I think in the 
kind of opposite usage of it. Like, tell me about the real, like, if it's a CVSS score of like a 9.5 or maybe a 9.2 or above, mm -hmm. even though I might have environmental controls, like if it's ranking that high in CVSS, it's likely something I got to pay attention well, to. I'm not yeah. saying you're going to drop but everything look, and fix it, it like this. but it might be something I got to pay attention to. Uh, look at it like this in the physical world. If you're bringing 50-gallon drums into your building... I'm so scared right now, Doug, because I know the way you like to make analogies and examples. It was starting off with a 55-gallon drum or something. I am so scared right wow, now. It's minty. Ribs <laughs> for your protection or your pleasure. Uh, no, but I mean, if you're bringing these 55-gallon drums in, and some of them are marked passion, passion and some of them are personal. marked flammable, and some of them are marked radioactive, you know, I mean, all that's a context. You can still bring flammable drums into your building. Sure. That, that doesn't mean everybody's going to die. It just means you need to know you have flammable drums in the building. If you're bringing radioactive drums, it doesn't mean everybody's going to die. It just means you need to know you have radioactive drums and you need to handle accordingly. So you have to segment and, and manage it. So that's, to me, what a that's CBS is. That's actually a really is. sane analogy. And, and usually and it, your analogies are, like, insane. And it, but, but that's if you bring, actually a really but, good one. But that, if you bring 55-gallon drums of lube in, it clearly means everybody's going to die. It, <laughs> no. no. If they don't like it, what it happens? Larry, that means party time. Time. That's what that means. Well, like right. I said, everybody's going to die. Silky soft, smooth skin. Now, silky soft, <laughs> radioactive lube. Nah, that that <laughs> could be a problem. That's a little more. Get those <laughs> barrels mixed up. Oops. Could be a big problem. Because whatever you do, do not spill the lube at the loading dock because infinite number of trucks will be able to fit in at that point. <laughs> <laughs> you might spill the radioactive so I have material. A, another point on the vulnerability thing, getting <clears throat> not to digress from the lube. <laughs> um. <laughs> It, and you know, and all, uh, this this goes back to PCI, where PCI says you know your vulnerability management program, you should be monitoring uh, various resources. You should have various inputs for discovering vulnerabilities. Now, in the old days, that was things like bug track and firewall mailing list, and and you know other mailing lists and bulletin boards, where people would write about you know vulnerabilities that were discovered. And, and this is not necessarily the fault of the industry or the fault of scan vendors, but I think the whole industry, every organization now, their primary source of vulnerability discovery other than Patch Tuesday is the updates they get on their vulnerability scan engines. Yeah. And okay. while I think that's probably pragmatic, uh, there's, there's, there's part of me that thinks that we've all lost at this point and we should go home. <laughs> but I, I, getting back to the, uh, the feature I was speaking of before if you have a vulnerability management solution and there is a new vulnerability that's released that's recognized that has a cve number <laughs> and also has been calculated a cvss score of a 9.0 or above it's likely that every vulnerability scanner on the planet is developing a, mm -hmm. a, a check yeah. for that it's right? all over that now chip. jeff i completely agree when we talk about in general cves that are being issued and even non-cves that have a vulnerability check it can be hit or miss depending on what solution you have. Right. I can say that with some level of authority because I've actually looked at that and, and tested that uh, to see what the coverage is like. And that's, and that's very subjective. I don't want to make it seem like whoever's got more checks or it is better or whatever. Like there's a lot of other factors that play in, but if there's a really critical vulnerability, I think that if your vulnerability scanner doesn't have it, that you probably need a new vulnerability scanner. Again, even defining a critical vulnerability without context is, is hard to do. Yep. Well, in this case, it would be something of CVSS score of nine. If it, and I think that's twofold, Jeff, and I, I kind of, I know where you're going, and I, and I like it actually, because if it's high profile enough to deserve a CVE, and like the dirty, not so secret of the industry, again, Matt, close your ears, yeah. not all <laughs> vulnerabilities get a CVE number, right? right. So there's mm -hmm. like an entire class that doesn't. So let's talk about the class that does. Of the class that does, there's only a certain amount that get a high enough score to rank 9.0 or above. Mm -hmm. Those are so high profile, you don't want to pay attention to those. Now, if you don't have that software, then you're good, right? But if your scanner is not testing to see if you have that software, because if anyone can raise their hand today and say, if there's a vulnerability release for any kind of software, like I know if I have that or not, 
no way like there's at least always one percent that you're not sure of at any given day and that drives yeah. it security teams and, nuts. and now i'm going to give you the but paul yeah. but no, paul the, yes jeff what gets us the highest scores in cves and i don't know the exact formulas but i think most of the time you know or what ranks a 10 is something that uh, very often, if not all the time, you know, there, there's obviously an exploit known for for it. It's in the wild, and it's you know remotely ex- it's remotely exploitable, which usually means over the internet. So again, the context is if you've got a system that's four, five, six layers deep in your network, not that that exists anymore, you know, you the context is even that nine or ten may not have to be mitigated as quickly as you think it does just by virtue of you know it's buried in a server that's seven layers away from the internet and only one guy has access to it and he hasn't logged on to it for three years or, you know whatever the scenario is and and i am going to give you one crazy analogy but this is the multiplier effect okay. so so this is where you've got the barrels you, of you haven't given me a chance to give jeff a rebuttal but that's well okay. go ahead rebut jeff <laughs> no no rebut that but you do want to fix those vulnerabilities and i'm not saying that if it's a nine if it's a 10.0 jeff right and Mm -hmm. i want to know about even if it's three layers deep and one person has access to it i still want to know about that because i might not fix it i might not drop everything today to fix that vulnerability however i might say yes it's a 10.0 and if this was on the internet I'd have to drop everything I'm doing today mm-hmm. and fix it. If it's mm-hmm. deep within my network and there's, and there's compensating controls, I want to be able to know about that to say and talk about it with my management mm-hmm. to say, I think we should our fix risk this by level, the end of the week. Yeah, we sh- end of the week, end of the month, 30 days, 60 days, whatever it is, yeah. be able to attach some type of remediation plan to that vulnerability. Whereas maybe everything 5.0 and less... <laughs> I'm not going to go out of my way to even attach a remediation plan to it today. I may lump all those together and attach a generic remediation plan that might be three months or six months out, but I still want to address those vulnerabilities because mm-hmm. as we know, low-level vulnerabilities can yeah. pool together and be high. Yep. But th- that's anyway. What you've just Load described is a risk ranking score that's based on yep. you know, environmental... Yes. Uh, you know, you know, whatever the whatever the scenario is, sure. any any factor, you know, you've done it in your head, perhaps, mm-hmm. but but you are doing that risk ranking that uh, PCI, by the way, allows you to do internally, uh, but few companies know about it because most people just take the CVE score or whatever the score is that their particular scan engine produces and they they jump through hoops based on that. And I know that we've had reports. I know we've talked about or I've seen reports where, you know, like 98% of the vulnerabilities that make it to the CVE list are like 7.2 and above or something like that. You know, they're always just high enough that everybody's got to, you know, do the fire drills to fix them. Right. Or at least create a plan to fix them. Yep. So, yeah. But I Jeff do want to come. You know, Jeff yeah, and I have to, had to, a to healthy a discussion. Fu- yes, get a thank fire you, drill to create the plan to fix them. Right. So back Good to point, Luke, Doug. Yes. But I do want to mention right. the multiplier effect, which is, which is where... This is now lube by itself is harmless, sand by itself is harmless. Oh shit! But when you have lube oh, and no. sand you at the same there. time, <laughs> and that analogy is so I, I had painful. to come up with one for Disgustingly you. Disgustingly describes the situation that I alluded to earlier. <laughs> I knew I would get there. And this is, but that that's these the, are the types of analogies that Doug is known for. That's right. He I'm is famous renowned the world over. for these types of and, analogies. And let, me, and let me tell you, it doesn't take much sand to spoil a whole gap. You're drum damn right. <laughs> and, but that's and I mean, where you need the pen true. test to actually combine the lube and yes, the sand and, and uh, absolutely the exploitation. And, and that's why I, what my cautious. <laughs> The, the sandy that made lube, so much sense, Jeff. That was, <laughs> the sandy lube conjecture that is is to caution you once I, again about someone getting someone right now is registering <laughs> sandylube.com God. and it's going to be sandy lube penetration to sandy lube security. That is my new consulting company. You can come to Sandy Loop Security, and we will penetration test. But but that was I, I talked about that at RSA about about the Sandy Loop. <laughs> yeah, no, they wouldn't let me say that. So I just said daisies and flowers or something. But I mean, I I, I really want to caution you once again about this discreet thing, the where Sandy Loop, where you get down to the level of saying. 
It's just... Uh, uh, it's I think we found a name for this episode. <laughs> <laughs> that is Sandy Loop Security. My work here is done. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Doug. But, but yeah, so that discrete model just saying, here's a score, I'm done, I fix it. Here's a score, I'm done, fix it, is not going to solve all your problems because there is. that's where, Jeff said, that's where the pen and test you know, comes in. The best remediation programs I've seen actually are custom software that takes into account multiple... Uh, variables yeah. that play into a risk factor and you'll learn about the like standard factors for risk and all that stuff Matt but when you, you look at it pragmatically it, it's a lot of different factors remediation right. sensitivity of the data location in the in, in the network how many people are using it how business critical is it which sensitivity and business criticality are two different things and and they take all of that in con, into consideration one thing that I think is still somewhat lacking is when Larry comes in as a pen tester and goes, you get that vulnerability over there and this one over here and this one over here. And, you know, all three of those things are pieces to my puzzle and I can use all three of those to, and now I'm domain admin. And you're like, whoa, yep. hold on. How did that, how did you escalate from there? And it's that Sandy See, Lou, here's, Sandy Lou premise. Here's three fives right. that added up to a fifteen, and and that was was what I was talking. That's that's Sandy Lou, and you're you're yeah. there. So <laughs> five times three, carry the one. So, so where okay. should I redirect <laughs> SandyLube.com? I don't know. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I just bought it. <laughs> Goats. <us. laughs> Sandy Lube, do, defensiveintuition.com. Hold on. <laughs> SandyLube.com was available. Yes. No one had registered Sandy Lube. Like, I, that is just amazing to me that no one had registered that I wasn't domain as until, fast as Larry until on my just phone, now was, on the show. I, now, the, now the Thursday, the, May 17th. The, the only. At, it, it, like 7.59 I was like PM. eight keystrokes behind it. The, so the, I was the only, the only one that Sandy might be... Sandy Lube should become wait, a website. The, and how many strokes behind him were you? Oh, like eight eight strokes. <laughs> the, only, the only one that might be better, Doug, and I'll leave this one to you. <laughs> SandyLube.io. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It's all yours, buddy. Or, geez, Sandy Lube. <laughs> okay. Yeah. This is why you need to watch the show live, because every once in a while we've got these fabulous domain registration, <laughs> and it's a race. And if you're watching live, I guess it depends on the delay. Larry's got the advantage because there's no delay. <laughs> And I gotta fucking start selling domains because that's like ninety seven. Yeah, <laughs> that's well, that's your retirement plan. I feel oh, like. Yeah, you should have seen what domains. my accountant said about last year. After I started being in the shows, I started registering domains, and I, I think I racked up like twelve hundred dollars worth last year, or something <laughs> like that. That's yeah, about my GoDaddy. I just about I don't know, Larry, year. like what the market value is for spear fishing for poop sharks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll help you with that. I'll, I'll, I'll help you. I also don't know what the uh, the market for my computer, uh, my other computer is your dot computer, <laughs> and Ron Jeremy's dot Wang. Uh, I don't. I want to see you use these in your phishing campaigns and see how many people click on <laughs> your computer is my other dot computer. Uh, change my password dot org is a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> do you have that one? I do. <laughs> hey guys. <laughs> Hey guys, unfortunately I need to drop off. It's been fun. Uh, Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Bye, Jeff. Bye, Jeff. Uh, sorry I wasn't in studio tonight. I'm missing all the fun. Yes, <laughs> you are. Till next time. See you, Jeff. <clears throat> oh boy. Larry, other Speaking uh, of Sandy Loop stories. <laughs> <laughs> other stories. What do we got? I'm asking you for your your oh, you had stories in there. I did. I did. Uh one that I that uh so we stood up a um uh, channel for SANS Sex 617 alumni um, when we were in Austin and one of the students credit where credit's due um, uh, sent over a story that I thought was just fascinating uh, it was using um, a, a particular GPS based chipset that does all of the GPS technologies whether it be uh, US GPS GLONASS what is it it's Baidu in China like all the four GPS technologies and taking all of those and combining them to one. Social networking. Uh, there's China. one there. E either way, um, I'll, I'll look at the story because it lists it. Um, but taking all of the data from all four of those, with all four of those technologies, you can get down to centimeter accuracy, combining all the data together. Um, and uh, uh, so, uh, nope, it's uh, GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, Beidou, IRNS, and QZSS. So six technologies for GPS longitude, latitude, and location. 
you compare all of those together and when the doesn't fit somebody's doing gps jamming Ooh, and what they did was they tied that hey, collective ooh. What, yeah. they, what, they, what they did was they tied that to augmented reality oh hell oh good god <laughs> like yeah. like they they intentionally stood up a gps jammer uh you know the location-based jammer in moscow and they put on the virtual of reality augmented reality goggles so you could walk around and then all of a sudden you'd see this green blob where the gps jamming was happening so you could tell where this stuff was happening. Wow. It kind of reminds me of X-Men when yeah. the professor puts on the headset and he can like see all the mutants and stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I thought like <gasps> they're well, that's what they look is mutants but, like basically. Even better, but in the near future they're fundraising over crowd supply. Crowd supply. To build the product. Is that a crowd dot supply? Is that a domain of yours? No. Crowd crowd supply is like a Kickstarter. Yeah. Okay. So type thing. Uh, So uh, the really successful software defined radio, the Lime SDRs of Mm -hmm. their varieties, they went through crowd supply. It's effectively Kickstarter for technology products. Um, But they're actually looking to build one of these uh, GPS jamming detection augmented reality devices. That's really cool. Like, that is super awesome. Whoa. It kind of reminds me of the cave. Do, did you know about the cave at Brown University? No. The, uh, listeners that have been listening for a long time probably know I worked for Brown University. And they had a cave, which is like their virtual rea- reality uh, computing system. Mm. Mm-hmm. And, but now it sounds like you can build that, like these VR goggles are just building that like on your smartphone. Back in the day, I guess I'm down. I'm old now. Yeah, we, Hololens. It was that 35 pound <laughs> helmet. Yeah, where, where's <laughs> right? Where's Russell with his Hololens? Yeah, Hololens. That's another one. Yeah, yeah Russell's got all that kind used of. Used to have like a room full of supercomputers to yeah. generate that virtual reality. Now you can do it in your smartphone. Yeah, you just kinda, hold it up with a camera and you can see. You know, you can see through it. So you it went through multiple goggles. iterations. I'm sure they're doing way more advanced things you can do in your smartphone today. But that was you know one of the early examples yeah. of that. So. That is really cool. I like that. So, yeah, I thought that was fascinating. Uh, what else is fascinating, Larry? Well, let's see. Uh, uh, the the one that I actually thought was uh, uh, pretty damn cool as well. Turkeys hacking from, people? Um, nah, I didn't think that was really cool. <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> That's that not sucks, cool. But let's talk about that one. Well, it says a new report details a widespread campaign targeting several Turkish activists and protesters using the infamous government malware Finn made Fisher. by Finn Fisher. Yeah, which is like, that's like that's getting long in the tooth, isn't it? Yeah, I feel like John Strand did a webcast on Finn Fisher like two years seven ago. years ago. Oh, <laughs> something two years. Yeah. Like yeah. Maybe it was yeah, two like, years ago. But. Uh, yeah, but still one, one kind of sad, but just a reminder that, you know, in... in there are other countries out there in the world that don't uh, that that hate enjoy freedom. It. Why do you well, hate that, freedom so much, Larry? Yeah, I don't know. Why do you, why do you hate freedom? <laughs> uh, that's my favorite question to ask it a speaker. Is, uh, why do you hate freedom other, so much? And, and Larry's done this to me. I'll be presenting or something. And I'll be like, does anyone have any questions? And Larry will be like, why do you hate freedom, freedom so, so much? much. <laughs> like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, just because I can, because I'm an asshole. Um, but yeah, it's good. It's good to remember that you know there are company, country, countries out there that uh, also county countries. Yeah, uh, counties in a country. There as well. are counties and yeah, countries sure. and companies in yeah. countries uh, that also uh, hate freedom uh, or just don't so enjoy much. the same freedoms that we do here in the U.S., um, which is kind of disappointing. Uh, what's interesting is uh, this Wapiti Web Application Vulnerability Scanner. Larry, do you use, uh, or Jason, do you guys use uh, an open source web application vulnerability scanner today other than a proxy? Like Zap is a really good proxy. Burp is a really good proxy. I think it's free the kind of vulnerability scanning capabilities are somewhat limited unless you buy the commercial product, mm-hmm. which I have no issue with whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you using other like open source web application vulnerability uh, scanners? W- of course, NetSparker has been a long-standing sponsor sure. of the Security Weekly Network. I really love their their technology, of course, and all the people there. But um, so we do not use an automated scanner. 
Mm-hmm. Um, we are typically yeah. using something like Burp or Zap. Um, and there's yeah. and and an external and assessment. I can totally see that you're not relying yep. on a vulnerability scanner right. anymore. Yeah. Right. And um, yeah, so we're typically doing a lot more of that manually. Uh, also for mobile stuff as well, mm-hmm. because the, pro- the proxy. proxy really right. becomes helpful. Um, but but the folks at NetSpark are given, you know, when we've talked to Sven, like, oh my God, like, I'm in awe every time we talk to Sven. Oh, dude, um, he's so smart. And, uh, you know, it's one of those things that we probably need to start adding to the toolkit, especially for some of our repeat customers mm-hmm. um, to to you know, at least get some of the low hanging fruit initially. Yeah. Um, so I, I thought this one was yeah. interesting. It's command line based, um, and it was a pretty easy install uh, via Python. And you'll probably see an mm-hmm. upcoming technical segment because uh, in the age of Docker and containers today, mm-hmm. which Matt, it, you absolutely have to learn. Docker and containers. Uh, Docker and, and Kubernetes. Yeah, in your final year in school, however you get that, dude, like you have to learn that stuff okay. for sure. Yeah. It's the future. Uh, it is the future. I'll just uh, write that down. Yeah. Docker and containers. I'll, Make sure I'll you remind do you. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but what's interesting is uh, uh, when, you know, in previous jobs, I've been evaluating technology throughout my whole career, right? And, you know, early in my career, I'm like, I got to, like, rack a server. I got to install Linux on it. Mm-hmm. And I, I got to, you know, put my application on it, and then I can test it. And then as time went on, I'm like, I need this new VM. And on top of that VM, I'm going to, you know, put this application. Mm-hmm. And then as time went on, I'm like, oh, there's already a VM that's available. I'm just going to download that from the internet, and it's already got my applications pre-installed. Fast forward to today... Sure, you can go to the cloud and get uh, VMs as well, right? Mm-hmm. That was the, another change. Yep. Like, locally, I can run the VM. Now I can run it in the cloud. But fast forward to today, I'm like, I need a vulnerable web application that I can do testing against. Mm-hmm. When you search for Docker and WavSep, which is uh, Shea Chen's uh, sectummarket.com, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I believe is the website, uh, he wrote a vulnerable web application called WavSep. And I remember configuring that manually. And then I was in my, uh, you know, prepping for various technical segments, and I'm like, I need that. I'm like, I wonder if there's like a Docker instance. Sure enough, there was. Yeah. So it's if you trust the repo, it's big, big, big mm-hmm. if. If mm-hmm. you trust the repo, you can run one Docker command to pull down WavSep. You can run one more Docker command to run that instance. Go to localhost port 8080, and magically it's there. And I'm like, holy crap! Like this, that's awesome for testing stuff. Yep, vulnerable Vir- applications virtu- or tools. Virtualizing your application as opposed yes, to the entire exactly the yeah. entire stack. So with like two commands, basically, I've got a vulnerable web application running. And in years past, many of us listening to the show, many of the hosts here are like, it was a lot more work than that. Uh-huh. Now I'm not saying learning. Make sure you learn the hard way, right? Yeah, but yeah, also yeah. learn like the Docker way. And be like, wow, that's a really easy way yeah. to like get <laughs> an application up. Now running. think now think about this, Paul. Go. Dockerize something that requires Ruby. No, 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 no. <laughs> wait, wait, no, 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 no. This is a good thing. It is a good because thing. Because think yes. about all the Ruby dependencies and Ruby versions and... Oh, and my Python's God. Python's the same way. But oh, and, 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 heck. And, and so, you know, kind of my, oh, my story Jay, along those Jay, lines Jason had a comment is, there. Uh, if you're using someone else's Docker repository, that's one thing. If you're... Uh, so I was in this exact same situation. My vulnerable web application, I'm like, oh, I can run two commands and it's up and running. That's mm-hmm. awesome. Now I have to trust the repository and there's nothing funky going on. When I looked at Wapiti, there was no such... Uh, there was a Docker repository, but it was a very old version of the application. So I decided to run it manually. So then it's like Python virtual environment and all the bullshit that goes along with that to make it work because it wasn't in a Docker container. If I were to take a project that I found on GitHub and say, I want to put that in a Docker container. That's a lot of work today. Yes. And I was commenting with Ron Gula on Enterprise Security Weekly. I'm like, you know, and there are uh, uh, technology that exists that are working on this. and probably have it. Take my application and put it in a Docker container without me having to do all that work, like automate that process as much as possible. That's a great startup uh, today. And there are, are companies that I believe are working on that. So, uh, Jason. I was just going to add on to that. I, I, you know, like you, Paul, I remember setting up vulnerable apps and spending all that time working on it. I just did a webinar, a webcast, a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things I was setting up was o- uh, Juice Shop, OWASP Juice Shop, which is a sing- JavaScript single page app. And it was literally you run a few commands and you're explaining this to the target audience. Here's how you can do this on your own system. You run these four commands or whatever it is, and 
<clears throat> you're up and running. You've got a vulnerable application. And when you're done, you hit delete and you're done. Mm -hmm. um, and you see that happening now. Um, I know um, Samurai WTF is moving yep. in that direction. They're, mm -hmm. they're dockerizing a lot of those, those vulnerable apps that they had to um, deal with Ruby dependencies or P conflicting dependencies between apps and stuff like that. And now it's just inside of a Docker instance and as part of the configuration and installation of Samurai WTF, it's, it's literally a few commands and boom, there it is. That app's ready to go and then the next one comes down, the next one. What's so funny it's, it's fabulous. It, when you download the security onion, it's Docker containers running inside the VM <laughs> or inside of security onion, right? <laughs> it's awesome. And so they're moving in that direction where it'll just basically be all Docker. Again, Matt, re-emphasizing yeah. it's super important, especially in your last year uh, of university to learn that technology because yep. you're going to have it's, to. It's one of those things that I uh, would very much reference the Circle CI blog on Kubernetes and that's becoming a reality. Right? And, we kind of joked about it. Like there was a time not that long ago when we we're like, Docker's really not ready for production. Mm -hmm. Kubernetes wasn't really ready Kubernetes, for production. And, but all that has changed. I feel like in the past like six, year, six right? Months. Six yeah, months. Yeah, six months yeah, to a year, a year that year, stuff yeah. is, that's changed. Kubernetes has Kubernetes won. went from being this like strange, odd thing that was floating around out there to like, oh yeah, this is a good product to, to like yeah. very quickly. Yeah. It's like, yeah. what? Last yeah. I knew I was making fun of this because like you had to do this thing with this thing that right. like some BDSM dude wrote that didn't really work. <laughs> like, seriously, that's what it was all about. I'm like, well, shit. Now it's a... Oh, now Kub it's like mainstream. Like, mm -hmm. shit. It's not like, a kink anymore. <laughs> Like shit! Now I got to learn Kubernetes right after I learn IPv6. Like, yep. well, goddamn. <laughs> uh, not really a great analogy. I think, but, uh, <laughs> no, no, I said right after I. Right learned. after, yes, that's you. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, other stories you want to talk about? Um, Richard Baitlick went to Splunk. I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. If we want to talk, I don't know if we've ever really covered like who's going to work for what company. Nope. I find it kind of interesting. I'll, I'll, I mean, I'll leave I, that, I, I leave that I to do. Chris Hoff myself, but I, really, Beaker? Yeah, because he's the one that does the official announcements for on Twitter for who's going to where. Oh, really? Like, that, whatever. Yeah, he's, he's made a bunch of those those announcements I've seen. Yeah, could start finding out you've been fired on Twitter. That's right. Like, yeah. That's a thing. It's a thing. Yeah. Or I got <laughs> a job. Hey, I got a job. I didn't know. Oh until my god. I checked Twitter. <laughs> right. I didn't know this. <laughs> yep. Um, one of the ones that I did have in there that I thought was uh, was well, damn sexy, uh, was detecting the evil password spray with Active Directory mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, and like those that. type of environments from Trimark um, with uh, Sean Metcalf. Uh, everything that we've seen Sean release has been just oh, freaking, Sean is freaking amazing. To say um, he's awesome is an understatement. But this is this, this is serious. one of, this is one read of those Sean things. Metcalf's blog and all of his work. Yeah, yeah. You, sure. you will need that, Matt. Yes. And uh, it's a uh, so one of the things that we do all the time at Pentest is password sprays and no one can ever detect it. Like you need to be able to detect this type of activity. Cause it's not normal. It's, it's not. It's I mean, one person forgetting their password and trying to log in is one thing. When you start touching multiple accounts, when you and, touch thousands of accounts and, and generate thousands, you know, exponentially thousands yep. of, yep. uh, password or, uh, login failures. Right. That should set off a red yep. flag. And, and it doesn't in a lot of, in, in so in most organizations, it doesn't Larry. Uh, no. I feel like we have a sim to detect that, but you do. But you have to s configure your sim properly. Uh, uh, yeah, devil's uh, in the details. Yes. <laughs> so you ha one, you yeah. have to you have to know what Active Directory error messages and logging are generated. Right. Yep, you need to turn them which on. Is, you need that's to a know project which, in and of itself yes. just to know what could be logged yep. and is being and, logged and, and, that, and interpreted. And that, in my opinion, is the goal from Sean's blog mm -hmm. entry at Trimark is that he tells you what messages you need to look for in which cases mm -hmm. on which products and what sub messages you need to look for for right, example because if you're, if raw you're, active directory versus owa versus, versus ldap delta okay yeah yeah. Yep. yeah so looking at uh if you're doing against a workstation if you're doing against a server for smb or if you're doing direct queries against ldap yeah i can see that taking multiple different forms right yep and they all have different messages mm -hmm. it tells you exactly which messages you are and what thresholds you should actually consider oh that's awesome like oh uh, Yes, this this article is worth the. It's worth its weight in gold. It's worth its so bits in gold. It saves you yeah. some reporting time because you're like, uh, hey, 
password spring was successful. That's a finding. Remediation linked to Sean's blog post. Yes, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Uh, and you know, he, he gives you really solid advice, like configure your sim to do this, or at a minimum, run this PowerShell script once a week mm -hmm. and see what happened. Like, oh, that's not good. Why did someone try to get passwords for KRBTGT like a thousand times last week? Right. Yeah. That's the yep. pro that's the problem with Active Directory log parsing in general. Is it just so? What is it trying mean? to sort it out? What does it mean? What do I need to look at? Because otherwise, you're looking at ten thousand messages. I mean, yeah. even on my dinky Active Directory system, I'm just like it, it can be overwhelming. So yeah, that's a very good place to start looking. Yep. Is how do I parse this out and see Agreed. these obvious problems? Agreed. Yep. Sean Sean's a badass. I agree with that. Um, twenty five percent of businesses are targeted with crypto jacking in the cloud. Huh. Which we kind of talked about when I uh, was it last week when I talked about oh. someone uploading rogue Docker containers <laughs> and doing DDoS. Also, that could very well be yeah. crypto jacking. I think I don't think that's really news, right? Like that's just. A it's trend a today, and we're all talking insecurity and, about and, how, and, and I, and I hate like, are people not going to pay attention to security because they're not launching a DDoS, which mm -hmm. even if you're not trying to detect it, your upstream provider or your hosting provider is going to detect it and let you know so th that, like, you're getting notified uh, if someone is doing something else that's more obvious on your systems like ransomware, you're going to know, like, you don't even need your detection if it's really poor is oh i detected it because someone sent me an email after they encrypted all my systems yeah. and demanded a ransom so therefore i air quotes detected it yeah with crypto jacking like it, yeah my you might performance wise notice if you're monitoring closely for performance mm -hmm. you might notice that why, why is disk io going crazy on this thing right mm -hmm. uh, but if you're not monitoring for that it flies under the radar mm -hmm. and if they complete whatever task they're doing you may never know that that happened right. right yeah i was thinking the other day about stealth docker objects like could you create like these just very stealthy docker objects that i mean this was so this is something that was in the theory of object-oriented programming a long time ago it was about apis and and objects that were rogue that could you make them so that they're just sort of hidden can could you build and this is very very not solid thoughts i was having it was just like something i was thinking about was like could you build these like very stealthy docker objects that were just sort of floating around out there in the yeah it's hard uh, in everything i've observed uh so far doug it's hard to hide okay uh, a running instance of a container on your system uh although I, I i could be wrong there are people that certainly understand docker technology way deeper than i do but uh it, it'd be pretty hard to hide that image although it's an interesting strategy if you could in uh, run a uh, a container on someone's Docker instance. How would you hide that from their from Well, their the way console? they were hiding objects was just by scattering them around in memory, and instead of making them nice contiguous segments, they were mm -hmm. scattering tiny pieces of them such that it was hard. I mean, you could if you knew what the chain was, you could find it. But so I, w I was just thinking about it. I mean, I, I don't I don't have any evidence, or I hadn't really thought about it at sure. the like practical way. I was just like, this is one of those weird things. You're sitting around like watching your cats play and thinking about. Can you build a stealth Docker object that's built up of all these little <laughs> tiny pieces? And yeah, what's interesting is uh, when I was talking with Ron Kula, he mentioned a technology that uh, folks are working on. That um, when you think about how Docker works, right? You've got the uh, operating system, which is Linux. You've got the kernel, right? right. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is part of that, obviously. And then you've got Docker, which runs on top of the kernel, right. and then containers, which run on top of Docker. And so the one of the weak points in that system is the kernel. If as an attacker, I can take control of the kernel, then I can basically control any container that is running. I can also inject my own containers and control those as well because I control the kernel. Mm -hmm. There's technology that's working on making a microkernel for each container so rather than running on the same kernel i just give the container a, a slim down kernel that's only geared to what what yep. that container is doing i think that's really cool mainframe oh, is that so really is that how uh, a, a, a borrowed from a mainframe technology i can totally yeah. see that i mean it all is i mean all the container stuff is really just mainframe ideas where you you, you containerize things and they call it a shell so you well, could build what was interesting is when I presented at Source Boston last week, 
someone said, well, containers are really just like a, a cheroot with lots of options. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they are. Like, yeah, and I'm, I'm like, dude, I get that. And I'm like, I mean, that's, that's, that's a, totally that's a cool. mainframe shell yeah. technology where right. I'm just allocating, you know, and I can define kernel structures yep. in those shells so that you have your own unique environment on that particular mainframe, and it's, it's completely contained. Mm-hmm. So you can't, you, you, you know, and that was where a lot of early hacking stuff was going, was how do I break out of a shell? How right. do I get out of the shell? Break out of and the all of a sudden I'm VM, in this, yeah. like, wide world of I can control the big kernel. So I've how got do I these. break out of the matrix? Yep, exactly. And that's, no, so it really is just an So what you need to do is put a, a container inside of a container, inside of a kernel, inside of a kernel. Hell yeah. Which is that matrix theory that says why Neo in the matrix reloaded is able to affect the sentinels is because he's actually not in the real world. He's in, in another kernel. matrix. Mm-hmm. Like there's uh, a matrix and there's a matrix inside the in matrix. He's in a so when he broke matrix. out of the matrix, he was in another he's matrix. In a so meta so matrix. it's like a, it's a cross between the matrix and Inception. Yes, I was. Yes, yes. yes. It's a meta matrix. A meta matrix mm-hmm. in Ma- a 55 gallon drum of lube. Matrixception. And a, just a little bit of sand. <laughs> ah, a little bit. Wait, just go, it goes a long way. <laughs> a little bit goes a long way. <laughs> Oh. But it keeps things interesting. So, speaking a little of sand going a long way, you pee and pee, Paul. Oh, oh. God. <laughs> just make it die. It, there's just... <laughs> when we were writing the book, Larry, we started oh looking God. at you pee and pee, and we were like, good Lord. Like, we don't have... A, we, ain't who, nobody got time for this. <laughs> who developed this protocol <sighs> with, like, absolutely no security in mind ever? An engineer. Like, uh, huh. There was no... <laughs> Controls like even if you weren't security minded to design a protocol that was so trusting of other systems <sighs> without with like complete disregard like that that wouldn't oh, even make like bypass protocol yeah right like uh-huh. it, it it just like defies all even if you were designing a protocol that you said I'm not gonna like like know about security like you wouldn't design it in this way because of functionality like to design a reliable protocol that just accepts input and, and, and does stuff from anyone without validation. Just hey, so I've got this problem. I, I can't get in and out of this firewall. So I'll create a protocol that lets anyone submit rules to change the firewall. Right, mm-hmm. like just let me out. What could go wrong? It's like I, there's, I created a prison, and guess what? Everyone in the prison has the keys to all of the cells and can get out anytime well, they no, want. They, no, they don't have the keys, but they just need to go to the guard and ask for them. That's true. And, and, the, gar- like, yeah, and the guard sure. says, yeah, whatever. Go ahead. <laughs> that's, that's the engineering solution to problems, though. Because en- just engineers, so- engineers, not to, not, sorry, engineers, but engineers solve problems. They don't solve them necessarily in some specific context. It's like, I need to get from here to there. I build a bridge. I, I'm not going to worry about the bridge is going to cause all these other problems. I'm just worried about, I need to cross this river. I'm going to build a bridge. And, 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 the, and, and the bridge that we've decided to do is a dam. Absolutely, but I mean, because of that, I mean, security was never a concept that entered a lot of people's minds. I was talking to somebody about that yesterday, about pacemakers. And I was talking about, you know, when people engineered pacemakers to be embedded in you that were controllable, like why Wi-Fi. Like in Homeland? Yeah, sure. I That's mean, a TV but, but show, that, But that <laughs> person who designed that probably couldn't quite conceptualize that someone would intentionally antagonize mm that device they just that's just not something that enter their, their it goes head. back to this uh pivotal moment for me in the show in my understanding of what then was embedded security and today is iot security and that is mike murray when he came on and he said i i think of it like a scalpel and i extended that into a hammer right and so mm-hmm. my analogy and i give mike murray full credit for this right is that if i design a hammer what am i going to design the hammer to do doug Hmm. Doug, it's a simple question. What does a hammer do? Pounds nails. Pounds nails. Pounds nails. What else does a hammer do? I was trying to think of a funny thing. The claw on the hammer pulls nails. Extracts nails. Yeah. So I can design a hammer that does that really, really well. Mm -hmm. What am I not designing for when I design a hammer? To pound skulls. If Larry takes the hammer and starts beating people in the kneecaps, 
how do I design my hammer to... Pre- oh, wait. I'm not considering that with designing a right. hammer because I want yeah. my hammer to pound nails and extract nails. I'm not mm-hmm. thinking, how do I design my hammer to prevent someone like Larry picking it up and going... And, and that, and and that the traditional engineering model yes. was, I need to pound a nail. Here's a hammer. Right. We're not going to sit down and spend six weeks thinking about all the other bad things we could do with You're this. You're spending six weeks thinking about how is the hammer exactly. weighted? What metals do we use? Yeah. How large is the diameter of yeah. the head of the nail so Hem- that I... I and can I, not be I, too I, big, and, but not too small. And I exactly. see this. And I see this as a hammer and nail into wood, tick, 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 and then turn th- six inches to the left, tick, 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 tick. and ha- drop your laptop. Ha- <laughs> hammer said nails into Paul's kneecap. Right. Exactly. <laughs> like, yeah. Does it matter? Right. Like that's no. the use case. Is it hammers it's a, nails? It's a no, I like badass it. at hammer and nails. That's a really good. And you're spending for that. like another four weeks going. Okay, how do we design the claw? Like how big are the claws? Yep. How wide is the gap between mm-hmm. the claws? Mm-hmm. What's the angle of the claw so that I can most efficiently pull that nail? Out of, of mm-hmm. the right. wood, and, right? And I'm not I do, thinking I do that, about as a, what if someone turns it around and, and stick max that claw oh, so and it's pop But, but, but not, baby, but not yeah. even changing the motion. What happens when I stick it in Paul's mouth and I claw like that? Like, <laughs> exactly, oh, yeah. right? I'm like, oh, that's and I mean, I think that's a that's a really great analogy of what I knew you love that analogy. Computer you're science. all about analogies, Doug. Computer you're the, science. You're one of the best at analogies. No, thank you. <laughs> Computer science and engineering, that, that's such a good analogy for that because that was the way that it was thought about was I want to build, I want to solve a problem. I'm going to solve that problem. I'm not worried about people going to take this and use it for other, other right. means. What, and they're what, do what's that, it. what's that joke about the, the U S and the Russian space programs? Uh, the, the, the U S said, uh, that when we got to anti-gravity with, without gravity and we needed to be able to write, uh, our pens wouldn't write because the ink, there was no gravity to pull yeah. the ink down. Uh, so they developed the ballpoint pen at the cost of millions and millions of dollars. And the Russians use a damn pencil, <laughs> <laughs> right? There that's the joke. Anyways, I don't know if that's true, but. There you go. A, there's something in there about the Apple pencil. <laughs> <laughs> Some joke in there about the. It's the eye pin. Well, I, I, it's really cool. Anyway, I don't know. Anyway. It, there's lots of issues with it. But the thing about the Apple Pencil is that you know it is sensitive to the pressure. Mm-hmm. Like how much pressure you're putting on the pencil will determine what your line looks like. The angle that you hold the pencil will also change the way that you draw. However, the pencil right. play, pairs to your device via Bluetooth... Did Apple take into consideration what mm. if a malicious actor takes control of the pencil? And you, know, and you know what I can use for that? Paper and a calligraphy pen. Yes, yes, you can. Just say it. Go for the Russian approach. Russian. And you don't have to enable Bluetooth to use your calligraphy pencil. Right. right. Yes. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, more? St- Jason. Jason. Uh, uh, your story number two befuckers me. Yeah. <laughs> it's not befuddling, so I, it's befuckering. <laughs> I had the same reaction, puzzled as I'm looking at this. Is the web moves towards HTTPS by default? And I went, wait, what? Um, Google is to remove the se- secure indicator. And you're like, wait, what are you guys talking about? So basically is Google is changing the model in Chrome. And instead of marking uh, a site as secure when it uses HTTPS, they're going to assume that... Everybody's using HTTPS. What they're going to do now is mark any site that doesn't use it as not secure. Mm. Mm. So they're just turning it around and saying, anytime you run into a site that's using HTTP, we're going to make it look bad. We're going to say, hey, this is not a secure site. So I think that's I the that right was strategy, kind of interesting. Though. Yeah, it's HTTP shaming. Yes, but it, it is. is. But it yeah. is. But now there, this is uh, you know, give it three years, and this is going to fall over to other industries. In that, when I go to the cash register at the checkout, I'm going to not see the lock logo on the pin yeah. pad anymore, and I'm going to assume it's secure because it doesn't have the pin, the lock logo with the X through it. Mm-hmm. This sets well, a bad precedent. In, keep could. in mind, I mean, what are the other browsers going to do here? Are they going to change their model to match this? Or are they going to keep the lock? So, what are the users looking? looking for as they go from the device to device or app to app. Mm. So it, it yeah, it it's kind of makes weird. sense from the idea of we'll just turn it around and shame, but at the same time, we're going to confuse the heck out of people because in this case, <laughs> we look for this. In this case, we look for that. Don't use other browsers. That's that's. The- <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a choice but to use Safari on my iPhone. Well, but that's. I mean, that may be Google just being saying, "Look, nobody would use another browser. Who would use something besides Chrome?" <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's back to the hammer thing. You know, right. It's, it's, right. It's like, 
modern engineering. Who would use something besides Chrome? It can't, can't be possible. <laughs> I mean, I'm not far behind that, but... Did you guys see the story, uh, Bruce and I posted it, about uh, researchers yes. in China and the U.S. have begun demonstrating they can send hidden commands that are undetectable to the human ear to Apple Siri... Al- Don't say it. The, the Amazon's thing and Echo. The, the Google thing. <laughs> Um, they've been able to secretly activate the artificial intelligence symptoms on smartphones and speakers by using inaudible commands. Yeah. Well, think oh, about that's it. pretty cool. True. Yeah. Think about this. Do you want a practical real world example of that? <sighs> I'm really scared Uh-oh. right now. <laughs> the, the, no, First the, you got a barrel of lube. No. <laughs> <laughs> then you've I, got some sand. <laughs> I will give you I will give you a practical real world example if you watch the news today. I don't watch the news ever. Yanni, so. Yanni or Laurel? Oh, Yanni, God. what? Who? No, yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. no, seriously. No, I know you're right. Seriously, who is what? So there's an audio clip out there that fucking made to the, the Today Show and the National News this morning. Who's that Yanni? If you listen to, wait, who, depending on who you are, you hear the word Yanni, or you hear the word Laurel. I just hear the word stab. I do too, but. <laughs> But I think it's the voices in your head. But it's Doug. all it's all about how you perceive that audio. It's like the the red the sorry the blue versus the yellow dress thing. Oh, Jesus. But, but but no seriously, this is an audio thing that we talk about here. You listen to Yanni versus Laurel, and I hear Yanni because my auditory is tuned to the the higher pitches. But if you remove those higher pitches and you leave all of the bass, it says Laurel. And my son and I were messing with that last night. Neither one of us could hear Yanni. It was is all it, oral. I mean, drop drop, it, drop the bass and leave the treble. But is it all yeah. about the bass? And it's, it's all, all about tre- that bass. <laughs> treble. It's all about that bass. No treble. <laughs> no, seriously. You, you, it's all about that the bass. It's all about your laurels. Yeah. You, you drop the bass and leave the Let treble. Let the record show. Yanni. Paul is twerking now. <laughs> It's all, and at Thanksgiving, it's all about that based. That's oh, right. no. oh God! <laughs> and barbecue, it's all about that based. I thought you were making a Thanksgiving joke in in my light, which <laughs> well, it's I not mean, allowed, Larry. We don't talk about the Thanksgiving incident <laughs> I mean, on the air. I mean, shit. If you based after that, sh- <laughs> more the power to you. <laughs> more the power to you, man. You know, before, after, during, it's all you should base repeatedly when you're making your turkey. Right, just no sand. Just no sand. Just no. <laughs> I think that <laughs> rounds out the show. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> oh my God, for listening and watching Paul Security Weekly. All of Matt, our careers thank you, are over, <laughs> especially along with all of our hosts. Matt, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show and sharing your experiences. I thought it was great that you encouraged. Uh, I really got you in, are encouraging students at universities to create their own cybersecurity clubs, which I thought was awesome. So. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Hopefully you still want to work in this industry after appearing on an episode of Paul Security Weekly. I'll get back to you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you let us know. Larry, take us out. Over and Yanni. <laughs> Laurel. <laughs> <laughs>